Well, good evening, everyone. Um, first thing I will say is I'm no historian. So if I get a few facts wrong, can we just call it artistic license? <laughs> As you can tell, I've covered rather a lot of decades of golf, so I think that's why I've been invited, because uh, I've been around a long time. But the history of the Ladies' Golf Union, women's golf, when did women first start playing golf? This is sh still shrouded in mystery. Many claim Catherine of Aragon, they say. Uh, she did write that letter to Cardinal Woolsey saying, uh, my love, love of golf, but when they looked at the letter more closely, they thought it was the love of the Scots. And as you can see, it's not very easy to have actually <laughs> decided what was on the letter. Um, then, of course, Mary, Queen of Scots. Well, that's perfect. Golf, home of Scotland. Surely she played golf. Everywhere she went, they claimed she played golf there. Again, there's nothing to really substantiate it. First thing reference that we can actually find in written words in 1738 referred to a match at Brunsfield Links. Um, early last Tuesday morning, two married women of the city stepped out onto Brunsfield Links to a concerted match of golf, followed by their husbands carrying their clubs. So they got that right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Curiosity led thither. The great crowd charmed by seeing the half-naked viragos tilt the ball so manfully. I can only think the half-naked <coughs> must refer to the fact they could see their ankles. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, the next reference comes 1810, Musselburgh, when the first recorded ladies' competition was with the uh, local Musselburgh fishwives. Uh, now, this competition, <coughs> oh yes, the ladies got the best tea times, it was in December. <laughs> and the prize was a creel and skull, which to you and I is a fishing basket. But by the mid-1800s, the number of new courses starting was increasing, but predominantly male. Uh, so it was a period when we also saw a few ladies' golf clubs, or ladies' sections of clubs, beginning to pop up and open up. Obviously the famous one, is Andrews, Ladies Golf Links, True Ladies, Formby Ladies, Westwood Ho, North Ferry, Royal Port Rush, many keep naming. And then in 1872, Wimbledon Ladies Golf Club was formed, only to survive for seven years. But shortly after, it led to the formation of Wimbledon Golf Club. Now, one of its new members was a wealthy publisher whose daughter was showing a keen interest in golf. And he took her to play, and of course this was Gisette Pearson. She loved the game of golf, and she was improving. And she was now looking for a better level of competition, for herself and her friends. She became a close friend of Dr. William Laidlaw Perps, a London Eye surgeon, who had also founded Littleston and Royal St George's, an RNA member. He had battled for some time to form an English or golf union, but no clubs in England wanted anything to do with it. But they, they struck up a friendship, a very unlikely friendship, because they were both strong characters. Uh, they both upset a lot of people. But with his encouragement, Isette began matches with other ladies' clubs one of which was against Lynch in Hampton, and this is where she met the distinguished golfer, Lady Margaret Scott. They are very old pictures, I hope you can see. I think she might have a little back problem later. <laughs> well, it was in these matches that Isette decided there was a need for a ladies' union. Ladies' golf was flourishing, and it was in the era of the growing support for women's voting rights. This was the time of the suffragette movement. Isette wrote to clubs with lady members asking them to send representatives to a meeting in London in April 1893. 63 clubs sent representatives. I think at that time that's a really good turnout of clubs going. And the meeting decided to form the Ladies' Golf Union. 
with his head as their honorary secretary and Blanche, Blanche Martin as honorary treasurer. Now they knew it wouldn't be easy. They had prejudices and opposition to overcome. However, on hearing of the proposal, Horace Hutchison, a leading player, RNA, I think, he wrote the famous letter, which I suspect many of you or most of you have heard, but I just think it has to be read again to believe it. I just love it, so you're going to have to hear it again if you do know it. Dear Miss Martin, I have read your letter about the proposed Ladies' Golf Union with much interest. Let me give you the famous advice of Mr. Punch, since you honour me by asking for my opinion. Capital letters, don't. My reasons? Well, exclamation, one. Women never have and never can unite to push any scheme to success. They're bound to fall out and quarrel on the smallest or no problem. They are built that way. <laughs> Another exclamation. Two, they will never go through one latest championship with credit. Tears will be due if wigs do not bestrew the green. And here we go. Three, constitutionally and physically, women are unfitted for golf. They will never last through two rounds of a long course in a day. He obviously never heard of childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> he went on north and they hope to defy wind. Temperamentally, the strain will be too great for him. And here his letter goes into capital letters. The first ladies' championship will be the last, unless I'm very mistaken. The LGU seems scarcely worthwhile. Well, wasn't this just what they needed? They paid absolutely not a blind bit of notice, just the incentive they needed, formed the ladies' golf union, and the rules were laid down. Very simple, five rules, probably the most important being the uniform system of handicapping they wanted to establish, and to arrange the annual British Challenge. And obtain funds, our real problem isn't always that. And the other lovely thing is that uh, she used work from her home address, and her telegraph address for the LGU was Izet. And this was the telegraph address for the LGU right through the old GPO telegraphic system until it finished. Well, just weeks later, the first British Championship was played. There we have the entrance at St Anne's. All in their boaters and their ties, and those are the semi finalists of that first one. The final between Izette and Mar Lady Margaret Scott was won by Lady Margaret. There she is with the original trophy. We'll come on to the other one in a minute. That's the original trophy. Those are the sort of clothes she was wearing. And Lady Margaret made it a hat trick. She won three consecutive wins, had three consecutive wins after which she retired from golf and Britain. The trophy was subscribed for by the Ladies' Golf Union, and now, oh, there's some of the crowd, sorry. That was the other thing I love. The amount of people watching. We didn't have TV, we didn't have iPads, and that one. <laughs> and again, there she is with the long dresses. And here we have the trophy. For those who go into the new club into the clubhouse, the new trophy cabinet. So the top is what you saw before on the base, and then the plinths have been added to take the shields. Sorry, are you able to see them? Yes. Yes, we see to take the shields of all the new winners as the years progress. Now interestingly, while these very strong female characters form the latest golf union, there's no doubt from everything I can see that Dr. Lady Lord Purbs was most supportive and helped them in many ways. In recognition of the help he gave to his head, he was made the first vice president of Lady Scott Union, a man, vice president. And indeed, soon joined by another man, Mr. Talbot Fair, and then Mr. Hugh Kelly. And over those early years, 
there were 25 male vice presidents, one of whom was dear Horace, who had written that letter. She always never gave him. And she always asked Dr. Lingle Purse to chair the meetings. Never, she didn't chair, he did. He said was a formidable figure. Words used to describe her were determined, terrifying, strong-willed, ruled with a rod of iron. One journalist, after losing an argument with her, stated, Miss Pearson is, des is as despotic as the Tsar of Russia. <laughs> and the other further criticism she received from other journalists was, you ladies quarrel so much over the golf. You're always having rows. To which she replied, well, you gentlemen made the rules by which we have to play. And they are so ungrammatical and illogical that not any two of you can expound them in the same way. <laughs> and I think that shut that chap up. <laughs> well, I, I don't think, I know we have to be very grateful now that she was such a determined woman and ensured the future of the game of golf for women. Her next challenge, as per their rules, was the handicapping. Yes, the LGU were the first to introduce handicapping, or handicapping system. Again, she received great help from Dr. Burbs in this. Now, having got the system together, the men's authorities thought it was ridiculous. They just laughed away, boo-booed the idea, then to their absolute horror, the USGA adopted it, after which the men also reluctantly adopted this handicap system. <clears throat> to my mind, still one of the best. It lasted for over 100 years, at least that was brilliant. Now, before we move on, I just want to show you this picture of semi-finalists at Westwood Ho. On the left front, what about the one in the tammy hat at the back? <laughs> Front left is Rona Adair, who won this particular championship. I'm now going to show you a close-up, because someone might be able to tell me. Look at her neck and buck, skull and crossbones. Oh. Now, maybe it was political, but I looked up Wikipedia <coughs> or whatever. It says skull and crossbones signifies poison. But this is an intentional deception by the elite to hide the symbol's true meaning. In fact, the skull and crossbones is an ancient instrument used by sorcerers to gain spiritual power. So do we assume that maybe she was getting extra strength and spiritual power to uh, help her win the championship? The championship was next, well, no, two years, a few years later was at, uh, oh, that's her, sorry, that's her in her semi-finals there, in 1903. Um, sorry, I have to go back. There we go. So the next ones were at Paul Trush in 1894, two years later, and they decided to then play a home international match, uh, England v Ireland, sort of friendly setup. And they didn't do that again until another nine years later at Royal True, uh, which marked Scotland's first appearance in the match, which they won. So the following year saw the introduction of the coveted International Shield presented to the winning team. This was presented by a Vice President and Mr. T. Miller. The competition then was still only between England, Ireland and Scotland, and in fact, it wasn't until 1907 that Wales were also included in the home internationals and competed ever since. At the turn of the century, golf's popularity was growing and his workload was growing. Subscriptions were based on the number of members of the golf club, not of the capita. As an example, a club just under 100 members paid an entrance fee of two guineas and an annual fee of a guinea. And in fact, individual <coughs> subscriptions didn't come in until the 70s. In 1904, May Heslett, Another wonderful swing of the field. She wrote about Ezette, saying, The union without Miss Pearson in her post of honorary secretary would be a miserable institution. 
and it's mainly through her efforts and strong personality that it has gained its present flourishing condition. Women's golf was gaining popularity in America. And in 1905, eight American women came over to play in the British ladies, during which time it was suggested they have a match against the British team, a British team, which the British team won 6-1. In the 1906 LGU handbook, um, it was recorded that Isaac Pearson was already in, interested in playing international matches. Now, whilst the LGU had many vice presidents, 1908 was the first time we had the appointment of an LGU president. This was Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Victoria, and she, on her death, was followed by her daughter, uh, Princess Helena Victoria, and I'm not sure which is which of those in my It's one or the other of them. <laughs> um, the secretary, assistant secretary, treasurer were still honorary positions, only receiving expenses. And the first mention of paid employees came in the 1912 handbook, when there were salaries to a secretary of just over 71 pounds and to a clerk of 50 pounds. During the early 1900s, the LGU were running ladies golf primarily in England, which is when they started county matches the first with just 14 counties, and again, they donated this shield for the county matches. <coughs> they obviously increased to more counties and eventually were run by, later on, by England Golf, Ladies Golf Association. Isette didn't marry until she was 49, and she then married the Mr. T. Miller I had mentioned, the Vice President, Tommy Miller, founder member of Lillums and Downs. Unfortunately, he died just five years later. Uh, so she, she then took up with the Reverend Thomas Herman, the vicar in her village of Singleton, half her age, and with Paul. <laughs> Thomas Herman apparently was not a vicar to do things by the book, having sired eight legitimate and seven illegitimate children. <laughs> it was quoted, if he were to wear his trousers the same way round as his dog collar, the population of Singleton would be far <laughs> Well, you can imagine the scandal. Um, I suppose in today's terms, they were an item. They lived together, they never married. At this time, Mabel Springer, affectionately known as Auntie Mabel, who was assistant LGU secretary, had started many associations, such as the Veteran Ladies, the United Services, Parliamentarians. She was a great organizer, and she decided there should be the British Girls Championship. There was a large entry in 1914, and they were just about to make all the final arrangements when, of course, First World War broke out, so the championship was abandoned. At the end of the war, one of the first undertakings Mabel did was to revive, to, to organize the British Girls Championship again, get the trophy out from storage, uh, have it engraved, and again, it was played at Stoke Poges. Now, I've only just discovered that that trophy, which we know as the British Girls Championship trophy, was not the original, and we've got a bit of work to do with Virginia. <laughs> trying to find what was the original. Auntie Mabel worked for a publishing, a journalist worked for a publishing company. And she, they ran a magazine called Eve and the Bystander. So here in 1927 is that trophy being presented to Diana Fisher. And you'll see it's called the Eve Cup, which you'll see by there. So we know that was 1926-7, definitely. And as you see, we can't quite see it on there, so it's not clear enough, but it does say presented by the bystander. So at some stage it was the Eve, then the bystander. Mabel continued to run this championship to 1923, uh, when she formed the Girls' Golfing Society, 
and they went on to run the championship right the way through until the LGU took it over in 1949. So, First World War was over, women were playing golf. The next president was the Viscountess Ronda, another strong lady who was at the forefront of the suffrage movement. She went to prison for blowing up a post box and not paying the fine. I gather she also went on hunger strike in prison, which was pretty horrific for those suffragettes. By now, the offices had moved from Isette's home to very smart offices in Whitehall, which they also made into a ladies' golfers' club for London. Isette, having been secretary for 26 years, retired to Lancashire. She became a vice president. She always continued to take a great interest in the ladies' golf union right up to her death in 1941. Love this little bit. Subscriptions were raised in 1922. So they made a profit. They reduced them the next year. It wasn't very wise, was it? <laughs> the LGU then had more than 1,000 affiliated clubs, as well as 400 colonial clubs. And when golf started to take off in all the Commonwealth countries, Australia, or India, they all formed their LGUs. But they were affiliated to the LGU here. Um, they went under handicapping, they were advised by them. That lasted right the way through. So it was Kenyan LGU, Indian LGU, and many of us have been on tours to these places over the years. But now, there was unrest about the management. There's always unrest, isn't there, somewhere? Uh, but it was unrepresentative, as the LGU was run by a group of members who all lived in or near London. So they called a meeting in 1928. 550 delegates attended the meeting. Amazing, they get that going out to any of these sort of meetings, down to London. The meeting started at 10.30. It was moved to a second venue at 3.15. <laughs> and it finally finished at 6 o'clock with all three proposals defeated. <laughs> Later that year, a further EGM was held with more proposals for the Constitution again defeated. Famous Cecil Leach said, after all that shit, the best committee was a committee of one, providing the right one was chosen. <laughs> <laughs> At this stage, the meetings had still always been chaired by one of the gentlemen vice presidents. And it wasn't until the late 1920s when Mrs. Lewis Smith became the first female chair. Going back to when that informal match was being played in 1905, playing for the Americans was sisters Harriet and Curtis. Harriet and Margaret Curtis. Discussions have been held throughout the 20s about holding a British-American match, but it was reported that the LGU weren't ready for a challenge. 1927, and the Curtis sisters gave it another push and they offered to donate a cup. Still, the British could not find a source for funding, and the answer was still no. Taking it into their own hands in 1930, US champion Glenn and Collette, the famous Molly Gurley, arranged for teams to play an informal match at Sunningdale, uh, paying all their own expenses. Says there was an estimated gallery of 5,000 to this match. British won. But this informal match did not please the authorities. They felt, uh, USGA felt it would upset negotiations with the LGU, and they were adamant <coughs> there should be no more team matches until officially sanctioned. By now, the LGU had 42 councillors and had moved to larger offices in Eccleston Square. Then eventually, the LGU chairman wrote to USGA to confirm that at a meeting in principle it was agreed they wanted to hold a match. Still having the problem of funding, but that they were setting up a special fund the interest of which would help fund an overseas team. The US delighted, approved, wrote to the Curtis sisters congratulating them on their idea and saying <coughs> thank you, you offered a cup, we'd be delighted to accept it and to name it the Curtis Cup. Now, I 
spoken quite a bit about the Curtis Cup, but I always think when one speaks in Great Britain Ireland about the LGU, I think one of the first things, an amateur golf, that comes to mind is the Curtis Cup. The two seem to go together, and how it all came about, I feel, is so special. Um, first match was played at Wentworth in 1932. It's Joyce Weather at second from the right. And I have to show you the 1934 team when they were setting off from London. <laughs> Love the first. <laughs> now the terrible thing is, I have to confess, three of the ladies there I knew very well. <laughs> On your left is Molly Gourley. Now Molly Gourley, as well as being a wonderful golfer, was a stickler for rules. Before we had rules schools and all these officials, Molly Gourley was the rules. She went round golf clubs, ladies' sections mainly, giving talks on rules, and we were all terrified of her. <laughs> Second to her is Diana Fishwick, who became uh, Diana Critchley. On the right is Wanda Morgan. Now, Wanda Morgan was one of the first lady professional golfers. Not as we know professionals out on tour, amateur status rules were very, very strict would have nothing to do with any sort of earning your money. And she was working for Dunlop on the golf side, so she had to be professional. And I still have my little Dunlop badge that she gave me all those years ago. And I think I'm right, second from right is Pam Barton, who was, who was killed in an air crash in the um, Second World War. At this time, the Vagliano trophy was presented by Monsieur Vagliano father of the great French golfer Lady Lady Segar, who did become an honorary member of the RNA. This was initially for matches between England and France, but then became a biannual match between Great Britain and Ireland and the continent of Europe. So now the LGU ran the British Amateur Championship, Ladies Home Internationals, County matches, the Bagliano Trophy, and of course the Curtis Cup matches. A lot had happened in just over 40 years. The next president was appointed, Lady Denver. Yes, another one who supported the suffrage movement, another strong lady. I think the formidable ladies of the golf union were not people to be messed with. Well, she held office till 1938, when Viscountess Astor came in, next president. I'm sure you've all heard plenty of stories about her, but there's one I do like. When Catherine Cairns was appointed Curtis Cup captain, in her speech of acceptance, she finished off by saying, we'll do our damnedest. Lady Astor did not approve of that very quickly let Catherine know she did not approve of her word in this. Catherine didn't forget that. And when they won, she immediately sent a telegram to Lady Astor, which read, we did our damnedest. <laughs> <laughs> she received an immediate reply, which read, deplore your language, applaud your victory. <laughs> well, as you can see, she was LGU president for 21 years. After I see, which I see presidents had a maximum three year term of office. So maybe she outstayed her welcome. <laughs> but during the time she did present another trophy, the Esther Trophy, which was pre pre sorry, previously known as the Commonwealth Trophy by its name played between Commonwealth countries. And yet another trophy, the Stroyan Cup. This was donated in 1935 by Captain Stroyan father of previous girl champion. And this was for girls' home internationals. It was contested between just England and Scotland, and it wasn't until 1967 that an Ireland and Wales actually also were included in the competition. All the championships, of course, came to an abrupt halt with the outbreak of the Second World War. Most of the officials off to their various duties or ambulance most championships didn't start again until about 46, 47. 1952, 
The LGU decided to commemorate the forthcoming coronation, suggesting there should be a competition in the form of medal forces open to all members of affiliated clubs, including overseas members at that time. No handicap limit, best mess score from each club play in the finals, and it will be called the coronation finals. It also agreed that a jam and sugar spoon in a box should be given to each player in the winning club or at every club. And that was 150 final clubs, 300 players. Anyone knows where those are or any families <laughs> have them? I'd love to know. So started what was to become one of the biggest events that the LG ran for the club golfer. And it continued in this format until 1969, when they then had three finals as it grew. And over the years, as the entries grew, more finals were added, which then became 16 regional, with a grand final in 2001, played at St Andrews, for an overall winning cup. These beautiful trophies were donated by Bridget Jetson, LGU president at the time, now an honorary member of the RNA, and they are presented to the winners each year at the grand finals and also the, the winners now play the following year in the Rico Women's Pro-Am prior to the Rico Women's Open. The coronation forces continue to grow. I don't think the RNA when we merged could be, be believed. I think they just thought, well, that's one we'll knock off the calendar until they realized. More than 26,000 lady golfers from 1,250 clubs on average compete in each year in this event. Early in the 50s, the LGU transferred its headquarters to Sandwich Bay. The executive had reduced to 10. The Curtis Cup team still travelled by ship, backwards and forwards, rocking and rolling, playing shuffle ball on the way across. I don't suppose the best practice for Cup to cup matches. I think it's 1958 was the first time they flew. Always one of the big stumbling blocks for the LGU was uniform. Now, because of amateur status rules being so strict, we all had to pay for our own uniform, or certainly pay minimum of the cost. And I think up till then it consisted of a tie and a shirt. Well, by the time I played my first one, 62, in their infinite wisdom, the LGU kitted us out with voters. <laughs> Does it remind you of anything? <laughs> Is that the reason? Or maybe the reason is because one of our members, the one to the fourth from the right, was Marnie Spear, who previously been a windmill dancer. So maybe they thought we should be having our voters. You'll see on the right. Lady Angela Benalla. Second from the left is Michael's sister Sally. So off we go. However, during that trip, we did have an occasion to change our voters when we were taken out, oops, sorry me, <laughs> up to a rodeo. So it was changing the sets since that night. And I still tease Angela, she was cozy enough to the handsome cowboy. <laughs> Anyway, still managing with a skeleton staff, you can only call it that, and volunteers, the LGU then inaugurated a stroke day championship. Then their most ambitious move was launching the Women's British Open in 1976. Women's professional golf in this country was very, very early days, and most, I'd say most of the competitors, or a large amount of the competitors in that first few years were amateurs. Indeed, the first one was won by amateur Jenny Lee Smith. The following year, the LGU again moved headquarters, this time on the long journey north to St Andrews, and offices above the St Paul. The honorary treasurer at the time was more at night, and she told me she helped with the move to St Andrews, and in her own words, she drove the wretched championship caravan all the way from Kent to St Andrews. Those journeys of those caravans. <coughs> when the offices were still in Whitehall, there were a set of chairs with cross golf clubs. 
which the then vice presidents purchased for the LG, and these all went to St. Andrews, and I believe they're very, very valuable, so they're taking care of them. A boardroom table was needed that was big enough for the council to sit round. This was bought with donations. Uh, the first and most was given by the Australian Ladies Golf Union. Glass front of display cabinet by Mary Holdsworth, President Chairman. Lots of donations. There's one lovely one I like that Morag and her husband, what did they need in these offices? A doorstop was needed. <laughs> so Alan went out and he found a head of Mary Queen of Scots, because we all thought Mary Queen of Scots was <coughs> the first woman golfer. He found a poker which he attached with, to the head make the door stop. And the base unscrews. I don't know whether you know this, Hannah. Yeah, the door unscrews and he put some coins inside the base that were relevant to the LG. So uh, I just think that's just a lovely touch and that was certainly still in the offices when we left. Running the Women's Open in those early years was a struggle. It was a prestigious event but the LG just couldn't afford to run it. And very sadly, in 1983, there was no Women's British Open. Then along came our knight in shining armor, Sir Richard George. Sir Richard believed very strongly in women's golf, and he believed there was a place and a need for a Women's British Open. And with his amazing sponsorship over the years from Wheatabix, the Open went from strength to strength become the flagship event. The headquarters remained above St. Rule until the late 80s, when with the help of a loan from the RNA, the LGU then were able to purchase their own premises along on the scores. I think this is a good point as well to stress there have always been a good working relationship with the RNA. They've been extremely supportive of LGU, especially with Curtis Cup matches. They're invaluable. And people had said, why aren't you one governing body? Why haven't you merged? But there was still this image. It was an all-male club. It wasn't right time. And there wasn't really any enthusiasm for any sort of merger from either side. Sponsorship of the Women's Open then moved to RICO. And the championship at Nainau had gained um, status of being one of the five majors, which is a huge credit to everyone who had the work of belief to, and had put so much into the event. But the LGU were not sitting back. No, they were still striving for the good of the women's game of golf. 1995 saw the introduction of the British Seniors Championship, another beautiful trophy donated by former Chairman President Linda Clark. Then a few years later, Senior Home Internationals Irish team last year with it, a lot, donated by former President Chairman Sue Johnson. And there are many, many other trophies donated. There was a Pam Pan Barton Memorial, one goes to the winner of the British Open, uh, British Amateur Open. Most of the championships will be semi-finalists, finalists, team events, age categories, and there's a huge collection which is still being catalogued, a lot to work through. I don't think the RNA really realised just what a great collection we had and how well all the minutes and the albums have been kept over the years. So the LGU were now running four championships, the Coronation Forces, the Women's Open, and five different international matches, one of which was the Curtis Cup, by now a huge, huge event that attracted crowds in excess of 10,000. In 2011, they added the Junior Vagliano Trophy. Yet still, this was managed from the scores by a small staff, six or seven, not all full time, sometimes student held at championships in the summer months. The LGU has always been hugely dependent on the many volunteers the executive councillors, the selectors, the referees, the scorers. People who have given their time in so many ways as this portfolio, portfolio of championships grew and grew. But now there were many changes. New logo, of course, women's goal. But one of the biggest changes for the LGU 
was 2001 when the Unified Handicapping Congo came in. This took away from the LGU one of their biggest links with golf clubs, directly with golf clubs. They still had the Coronation Forsons link, Everyone had associated monthly medals, everything with the LG, and that all went. So a lot of club golfers just saw LG as running elite championships. The average golf club, club golfer now had little or no interest in how handicapping had started, how they had a standard scratch score, how monthly medals had evolved. Few read the notice board or information from the LG. And they did not see why they should pay their £2.50 each year to the LG. Just the cup of, price of a cup of coffee, no. More unrest. The LG and their reorganisation, the executive, and formation of LG Championships Limited, also gave an undertaking that these subscriptions would not be increased, and that indeed in 2020 they would remove them totally which I think was quite an undertaking. They haven't been sitting back, got all the mod stuff, Facebook, Twitter, don't ask me, but they never sat back, they were always going <laughs> So when the RNA welcomed women members, and Peter Dawson wrote to the LGU to suggest the possibility of a merger, it did seem the right and natural time to look to the future, to ensure all the work all the dedication given by so many to the latest golf unit was not in vain. The LGU had instigated many championships and internationals. They devised and run handicapping, scratch score assessments for over a century. They fought discrimination and apathy. They coped with changing fashion. And above all, they coped with that eternal problem, lack of fun. All this would not have been possible without the determination and unbelievable support from the staff and so many volunteers over the years, and we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Discussions between the RNA and the LGU started in early 2015. It was not all plain sailing. The LGU were accountable to their stakeholders, the national organisations. After all, the lady members have been paying £2.50 a year. You can't just hand it all away. LGU had responsibilities. They had assets. The Women's Open, probably one of the greatest, as well as their property, their trophies. They had to secure the future of women and girls' golf. They had to ensure that the game became all-inclusive, welcoming to all ages, all abilities. A lot of diplomacy, a lot of negotiating skills were required. It was a bumpy road at times. There were toys out of the pram. Oh, well, let's have another gin and tonic, and on we went again. <laughs> but it, the big thing was, at all times, it was evident that both sides wanted to make it work. That is what was so important. Of course, now, now Martin Slumbers, he was really in the firing line. He'd come in and take, over, over, take over the baton. So he was deep in the negotiation. And I would also say the national, national organisations help throughout and support was invaluable. The merger was completed on January the 1st, 2017. It can't have been easy for the staff during those negotiations. You know, wondering, they knew the negotiations were going on, they didn't know what was going to happen. The RNA had always assured the board that they had to have secure jobs and they moved there were six or seven in the offices, suddenly going into 150, however many there are now there. It was a huge change. I think they have all settled in extremely well. They've been made so welcome, but it wasn't an easy change over. So as we signed, it's a bit of a hazy picture taken on someone's phone. As we left the scores, having signed the contract that morning, the board and most of the staff there. A sad day in some ways, but still very special. Shortly before the merger uh, was actually signed, it was quite obvious that the announcement that the, that the initial heads of agreement had been signed, everyone knew this was coming on up. And the, um, at the 
few months before the sports, the, sorry, the Golf Writers Annual Awards dinner, they made a special presentation. And I had the great honor of accepting it on behalf of the LG, which is this beautiful trophy. So it's a one-off, especially from the Golf Writers, in recognition and gratitude, and I think the word is to the 124 years given as the voice of women's golf. To me, I see that as a lifetime award to everyone who's done so much through the years. You know, that's, that's why I had, had to bring it here tonight, because I've got all the trophies, but that was recognized. I think it's extremely special. There are many who didn't want to see the merger. You know, people loved the LG. They didn't want to see a merger. But equally, there was a responsibility on the LG to continue the work of those first women who had stood up for women's gold. So I believe the board of the LG showed that courage and determination. They knew they had to look to the future of the game for women and girls' gold. The RNA were promising an equal commitment to the development of the future. And whilst it's maybe not quite relevant, I just love this picture for the future. Our wonderful team, Victoria's team, two years ago at Dunleary. Great golfers, future, and many more coming. It's just a, just a picture of that. So. Well, the future is another story with the Women in Golf Charter, just the first chapter of that story. So, as we look back and admire those ladies who believed in the future, Isette, Blanche, many, many more, and formed the Ladies' Golf Union in 1893. Let's hope in another 125 years that people will look back and praise the RNA and the LGU for their vision uh, to look to the future to ensure the game became all inclusive for everyone. 1893. History is not just a story of the past, but it's a constant reminder of how we've arrived at the present. Thank you.